Hi and uh, welcome back to Wargaming World, my name is Greg, uh, this is the third interview that I've been able to do and uh, it's with Scott Driscoll from Australia. Scott uh, is a veteran of more than 30 years and he and his wife both serve and uh, he has been very very generous uh, with his thoughts with regards to Wargaming and his personal experiences and I think this interview is something you're going to really enjoy. Uh, if you have uh, any thoughts or ideas then please come back to me uh, and join the uh, Facebook group, the Wargaming World Facebook group, and we can continue this conversation. So, one word of warning is uh, the audio. It's uh, a phone-to-phone -phone conversation, as we had in the other interviews, so it's a little bit challenging. But I think it's something you're really going to enjoy. Okay, so without further ado, let's start with the trailer. Excellent. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, that's oh, true. There you go. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, all right. All right. So, lovely day this morning. So, uh, yeah, it's okay. So, uh, it's been, you know, a bit, uh, well, it's a bit challenging trying to set things up for things like this and just to just have a normal conversation. But, uh, yeah, yeah, all's, uh, all's good. Yeah, yeah. Like freezing cold here. Well, by Australian standards, it's freezing cold. Yeah, I was gonna like twelve degrees. Bloody, bloody horrible. <laughs> I was gonna say, what's, what's it like during the uh, during the day? I would have thought it was still quite a, a different, uh, oh, quite a decent uh, temperature. I, I think we topped at seventeen today. I think we got to the dizzy heights of the high teens, which oh. is uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the winter. Ah, uh, right, okay, because I, mean, I was saying my, my sister lives in Sydney, so I always assume that they've got like, it's almost like an English summer at the worst time in uh, Australia, but that's obviously not the case. No, no, I'm down in Victoria, so um, it's, yeah, we, we probably get the cult of worst winters, actually. You would think Tasmania would, but but we get the we, we get pretty cold once a year, so does the ACT, actually, right. which is our capital territory. Right. We get pretty cold there as well. Right. There's nothing. I mean, I, I spent six months with the British Army on the Rhine, and it was over winter. And man, I, I just couldn't believe how cold <laughs> that was. That was batshit crazy, man. <laughs> couldn't believe it. Well, the British used to call me Michelin Man because I, I wore so much, so many layers of clothes. <laughs> just, uh, uh, yeah. But it was funny. My, my father was a Brit. He was from the he's from the West Midlands. He's from uh, Around uh, Dudley. Uh, right, okay, yeah. Uh, Walton. Yeah. And um, when he was a young fellow, he, he went to Canada to work and he worked on the Trans Canadian Highway. And they used to get snowed in and they'd have to dig themselves out, work on the, the, the highway, then go back into these log cabins and they'd get snowed in. They'd <laughs> <laughs> have to dig themselves out again. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah. And then presumably he and went. I think, uh, he came to us. He then went to Australia, presumably, and then obviously the rest is history. Yeah, yeah. He he, he went to Canada. Um, he was a fighter. He was a professional fighter, boxer. Oh right. And so yeah, and then he spent some time in Canada. He went back to the UK, and then got a. a he, the reason he ended up here in Australia is because Jimmy Carruthers. I don't know if you know much about boxing, but Jimmy Carruthers was a world champion. And, he was in Australia and he was making a comeback so they invited my father out to fight him because my old man was the 
NCB lightweight champion at Great Britain. Right. In in the mid in the mid fifties. So he came out here, but and because he had a reputation for fighting left handers, being good at fighting left handers. Uh huh. And um, so they wanted him to fight Jimmy Carruthers. Um, but before they would let him fight Jimmy Carruthers, he had to fight a a a, 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 a Dutch fella by, by the name of George Kral. And he fought Georgie Kral and damn near killed him. And then they wouldn't let him fight. They wouldn't let my dad fight Jimmy Carruthers. <laughs> but once he got here, he went, hey, it's nice here. Oh, I like it here. So he stayed. And oh, so right. we're the first lot. All the families back in the UK, they're all in the West Midlands, basically. You could, you could throw a blanket over the entire family. Right. They're all, you know, all huddled around Dudley and um, Wolverhampton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, whereas... Whereas the family here in Australia was basically um, myself, my brother and sister. My brother and sister have both passed away. And then I, uh, my, my father's un- uh, brother came out as well. So there was, out of my father's family, there were four boys. One stayed in Canada, one stayed in the UK, and two came to Australia. Right. And, um, and uh, yeah, so the, the f- family here in Australia is basically, like my daughters are a 12-hour drive away. Right. Whereas the family in UK, no one's more than bloody fifteen minutes away. Well, that's exactly the same here. In, in so my my side of the family is quite sort of uh, disparate in terms of you know my uh, mum and, and her partner and, and uh, in terms of my sister then coming out to Sydney. But from my wife's side, we all live within about two miles of each other, which is nice. You know, it's a really nice thing. But that, that's the that's the difference. Yeah. One of the first things I wanted to ask is, is where did you start with wargaming? How did that start? Ah, uh, jeez. I was about four years old. I distinctly remember this. My mother brought home a box of Britain's toy soldiers. Right. They were British paratroopers, yeah, British paratroopers and German uh, Wehrmacht. Right. And from that point on, I went, I'm going to be a soldier. And, I, and so I, I played with toy soldiers and... I think I started, I got into Wargaming proper when I was about 13, uh-huh. and I picked up a copy of um, uh, Military Modelling with Battle for Wargamers in it. Right, yeah. And when I, when I was a kid, we used to get, you know, you get your pocket money and you go down to the local shop and you get a box of Airfix toy soldiers. Uh-huh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. so, yeah, yeah, and I think the first set of Wargames rules I got was a set of rules called Angriff. Which was an American set. Uh-huh. It was just a World War II set of rules, and um, yeah, and I think the first proper it wasn't until I joined the army actually, and I met a couple of lads in my first regiment that were war gamers and they were playing the WRD, WRG sixth edition right. ancients. Yeah, yeah. And so I started playing that, and but I quickly went, oh my God, I need a degree in math, advanced mathematics to play this thing, <laughs> and then. Um, and then we had a sergeant in the regiment who wrote his own set of rules. Right. And uh, they were called Spear and Shield. Uh, so there's so many sets of rules now, Spear and whatever, or Shield and whatever. Um, so this was in the, the late 80s, I think it was. And um, yeah, and then basically it was, it was all, and then DBA came out. And so I jumped on DBA and then, and then DBM came out. And so I played a lot of that ancients. And then there was Wargamers Research Group, Napoleonic Rules. Yes, yeah. I've always played historical games. Um, I could never really get into the, the sci-fi stuff, except when War, um, when uh, they brought out uh, Warhammer 40k Epic. Right, yes. They were a set of, they were a set of rules I, I saw like, oh, okay, I, can, I can identify these. And we played them for a bit. But that was my only venture into um, Games Workshop stuff, was, was Warhammer 40k. Uh, uh, 40k yeah yeah I mean uh, uh, my, my was similar in, in that I, I mean I played you know in the sort of 80s it's funny I thought I'd bring a couple of uh, props so in terms of getting into stuff I don't know whether you can see that but that's the first edition of the uh, War Games Illustrated yeah. so I got so that was where yeah. I really started on those kind of magazines and then I used to get them you know weekly and what have you if you could and then um, friends from school we, we sort of Interweight between we started by playing Warhammer, but in actual fact, 
Uh, really, I got into things like the English Civil War stuff and then the tertial rules, I think, that you could get. But you know you're right when you said about being, uh, you know, you had to be a mathematician to be working out the, the statistics of what was the, the impact of the fighting. And also, I mean, I, I just think about it now is that in terms of the actual scenery I had, you know, you'd have sort of like a green blanket and you'd stick books underneath so you could make hills and then some kind of... You know, you know, a bit of lichen or what have you. So the actual battlefield would be, you know, in comparison to what you do now, is is really basic. But that's where you have to start, you know. And I used to really enjoy it. Yeah, I think when you start out, I mean, that's right. I mean, again, it was a, it was just like a. We, I think my first proper war games table I had was was a six by four table because that seemed to be the standard for everything. And um, I used an army green bed sheet. Right. So as the as the table <laughs> cover, because that's what you had, and I and I would stick things like um, uh, mess tins and stuff like that, with a, an army green uh, bed sheet, and that was my war games table. Um, and the thing is, you know, you, they still had plenty of enjoyment. I loved the, I loved playing. Um, but I think the, the more you the more you play, and the more you start to build up your collections of miniatures and stuff, you, you, your your attention shifts to the terrain. Yes. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, the reason I think most people play miniature war games is the aesthetic aspect to it. Uh-huh. And that, I mean, and that's why a lot of the rules that I use, if, if the game doesn't look right, I just, I, just want, I just can't get into it. You know, it's like, why is that battalion all by itself over there fighting and there's another battalion over there fighting and it's like a starburst of battalions all over the table just fighting their own individual little battles I just can't get into a set of rules like that I've got to if I'm depending at the, the level of game I'm playing it's got to look like a battle and is that the reason why you've got into things like I mean I know you do lots of different things I was going to ask you slightly later yeah. but in terms of chain of command is that how that really is good because I think that you know at that platoon level it really really yeah. feels and looks right well I got into chain of command mainly by I just fell into it by accident. I was I went to we only we don't have many war gaming conventions here in Australia because first of all the country's massive. I mean I, I, it blows people's minds at the actual size of it. Um, it's the size of mainland USA, but it only has a population of twenty five million, uh-huh. and we're scattered all over. So you you know like if and, and like I think there's about three million in Sydney and there's about three mil, million in Melbourne. So there's so the rest of us are just yeah you know, scattered like so much chaff on the wind. <laughs> and so there's not that many conventions or anything like that because they're so far apart. You know you have to travel a lot to get to them. But we have one major one every year at our, in our capital Canberra called uh, CanCon. And I went there and I saw a guy who had set up this chain of command demo game and I, he said oh do you want to have a go I said oh yeah I'll, 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 I'll play and I, I, after about three turns I went they've nailed it because one of the disadvantages of being a soldier and I, I've been a soldier essentially my entire adult life uh-huh. is that if I play a war game especially something like a platoon level or company level war game and it doesn't feel right I just I go I, I, nah like, like for example bolt action Bolt Action is a fine game. Perfectly good game. I've got no criticism of it as a game. But it's as about... It has about as much commonality with actual platoon level combat as backgammon does. <laughs> it's, it's nowhere near. It's completely devoid. And whereas, whereas Chain of Command, if you want to, to understand what it's like, the kind of frustrations that a platoon commander has commanding a platoon... You play Chain of Command. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, because I've played, I've, I've never played a Chain of Command game where I've walked away going, oh, that was really unsatisfying. Because even when you lose, and lose badly, you can go, well, yeah, I can understand that how, how that could happen. You know, this is why that, that went that way. I mean, that was a stupid thing to do. Or, and the, the two fat lardies understand friction. Uh-huh. So that... The rules that I play predominantly are written by three. There's either Two Fat Lardies, Dave Brown, which is within Two Fat Lardies now, I guess you would say, and Sam Mustafa. 
because those guys understand friction. Right. And okay. I've been on forums where I've had people, you know, saying, oh, it's just too much, there's too much randomness and stuff like that. And I said, well, you know, <laughs> until you've been on a two-way firing range, man, you know, this is, this is as close as you'll get without, you know, the smell of people crapping themselves and people curled up, you know, screaming for their mothers. This is, you know, as far as a game goes, this is as close as you can get. And that, 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 and I, think... you know, I, I haven't seen a miniatures game yet that's as close to real combat on a table. And that's also playable. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's got to be playable as well. Yeah. And so Chain Command does that. And that's I, why I like it. I think it, it helps you really, you particularly from, I mean, not just in the current circumstances, I play a lot of this, it's just, it's solo wargaming. And the thing about it is, you know, yeah. you've got to roll the dice and it's a, it's a really random thing that can happen. You genuinely, yeah. sort of, you set out and you think, right, this is the way the, the force are going to do. So the last game I played, I thought, right, we're going to attack on both flanks, I'm supported by armour, that's the way that looks like. But in the first turn, the junior leader's killed and you think... It's it's really it's really unlikely that's going to happen, but it happens. It obviously then has a massive impact yeah. on the actual uh, squad that they're with. They stop moving, and then suddenly yeah. the whole coordination of what it is that you would have done, you know, it, it, it goes out the window. So you then have yeah. to from from one phase to another. Even though you're the only player, you you're suddenly now faced yeah. with a different challenge each time. So that really helps you to then. You know, really enjoy the game itself. Yeah, it's a it's a great it's a good system for solo play because there's so much friction in, in it. And and what I try to and it's the same as when I solo play with games like Pickett's Charge or Capture Bra. What I do is I go like, okay, um, I come up with two opposing plans. Like the defender is going to attempt to do this, and the attacker is going to try to do this, and I play those plans out to the conclusion and even when things go pear-shaped I still try to force that plan uh -huh. because generally speaking that's what commanders do they go okay now at platoon level it's a little bit different because you're right in the weeds at, at platoon level but let's talk about something like at, at, at the grand tactical level and I'm talking about like um, a battle like the Battle of Catra Bra or, or something like that basically the battle plan is decided and it's like yeah you know, I understand that there's going to be some um, some friction there are going to be things that are going to work against the plan but the plan is sound so we need to push it to its logical its logical conclusion and and accept the fact that I need to maintain a reserve if just in case it all goes to clad Um, but the chain of command, because it's a, at a platoon level, you, you've really got to um, you've got to be adaptable. You've got to be able to go, well, okay, I'm going to put down a base of fire with this squad, and then I'm going to, you know, attack with this squad, and my third squad will be my reserve. Um, but it could turn out, okay, this this NCO has been clobbered. Okay, well, I'm going to now make that my base of fire and maneuver with my other squad. Uh -huh. um, and so there are there are things in chain command. I mean, it's it's. I think it's really good for solo play because of the, the randomness of of activation. Like you can you can activate. You, you know that you're probably going to be able to activate some stuff, but it's unlikely you're going to be able to activate everything. Yes, that's right. And and obviously, you yeah. know, in comparison to bolt action, then you really you know you've got a set of dice and you you know that all of them are ultimately going to be activated, unless, of course, I suppose you could play it where you actually reduce the number of dice in the bag and, and do that. On a slightly yeah, different well, note... My, my, biggest, my biggest issue I had with Bolt Action, and I did I wrote up a comparison between the two rule sets, um, and I think the two fat ladies actually put that up on their, their, on their forum. Um, but the, my main concern with Bolt Action was, from a from a realistic perspective, was the fact that the, the, the lower the quality of your troops, i.e. the cheaper the, what they were, it would generate more dice. And the person that had the most dice was more likely to maintain the initiative. Yes. So it was, yeah. it was 
counterintuitive. It's like, what? Why is it that I've got this horde of crap, and I'm dictating the battle to the more tactically nimble guy who has better trained troops? You know what I mean? It, 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 and and the other thing is, you couldn't coordinate because it was like I can move this thing, and then I can move this thing. So you could have a situation where you're going, okay, I'm going to drive a tank down a road with infantry behind it to either to because the tank's providing cover for the infantry and the infantry is providing security for the tank. Okay, if I draw two dice in a row, I can do that. But if I don't, I can't. Yeah. So I could drive the tank down the road, leave my mug infantry in the middle of the road, and then if the other guy gets the dice, he can light up the mug infantry that's standing, scratching their butt in the middle of the road. <laughs> now, I, I think they fixed that in the second edition of Bolt Action. I think they created a, 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 a mechanism where you could you could move multiple units at that you know one time or something by using an officer uh, thing. And as a consequence, everything within his radius he could move. I think they did that. I must admit, I, I don't know. But, but in the original Bolt Action that was the thing that I went. Uh, this thing's dead in the water. Right. You, you know you can't coordinate. You, and it's it's difficult to coordinate troops, but the, the reality is. Tank on, you know, in a tank in support of the platoon isn't just going to go rolling off doing its own thing. It, it's the tank needs the infantry just as much as the infantry needs that tank. Yes. Can I just ask about you know what is your your favourite period? in terms of, well, military history and uh, war games. If you're going to say, right, okay, I'm going to stick to this period, what would it be? Oh, man, it would be, I, that would be very tough. I think, oh, jeez, I'd be, I, I'd be very hard to choose. I mean, it, I, I guess it would be, I guess it would be the, the Black Powder era, simply for the fact that, because the American Civil War falls in there, and if there's any war or conflict that I've really been passionate about, it's been the American Civil War. Ah, right, okay. And I know there's many people that, but but I've, I've really, I've spent a lot of time studying that war, and I've walked a lot of the battlefields because I go to the United States as often as I can. Uh-huh. Because I really, I, I love that country. And because I've got a lot of mates that I serve with that, you know, American Marines or American soldiers often catch up with them and whatnot. But the American Civil War is a really unique war, and it, it's a war that, if you understand the history, you realise it was a it was a war that was fought amongst Americans. But the consequences had would have had well, the consequences of that war had effects far beyond the, just the United States. Right. And then you have, and then and the personalities within it. I mean, guys like Longstreet. And guys like um, uh, Claiborne and 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 they're, they're really interesting individuals in their own right. You know what I mean? Uh huh. I mean, I mean, I look in, I look yeah. at that period and think whether it's quite advanced weaponry, but in terms of the actual strategy, it, it sort of makes me think about Napoleonic strategy. But maybe that's just a really naive approach. Yeah. Well, it's. They, they, well, they started off that way, but after it only took one battle for them to go, well, that sucked. This standing shoulder to shoulder thing, um, it, it, you know, I mean, there it, it, it was, it, it was, it was like, it's a bit like Napoleonic warfare, but the, the, the troops themselves on the ground, it's, so you get a lot more skirmishing. Right. So the, the, right. the skirmish ability, you know, you, you had a lot more loose for, looser formations and the like. Uh, and cavalry didn't really dominate the battlefield anymore, so it really was an infantryman's war. Um, uh, but it's just, yeah, I, I just find it a, a fascinating war, right? The American Civil War, but but also, I mean, I, but I, I love the the Napoleonic Wars as well. And which scale? Because of the colour. Ah, oh, well, I got them in fifteen and twenty eight for the Napoleonics. Like for example. And I'm, I'm contemplating going down to six right. <laughs> because um, I'm just about to launch into a blue chip campaign, which I've already played. And what I did 
did is I rebased all my 15 mil miniatures onto blue chip bases for that, that rule set. Um, and the bases look fine, um, but I, I can't help but think, you know, this would look really, this would be better in 6 mil or 10. Right. Um, so I, Napoleonics, man, that, my problem is my largest of all my collections are problem on Napoleonics because I have them in 15 and 28 and they're both of those scales. They're huge. I mean, I have literally thousands. Right. Thousands of miniatures in right. both 28 and 15. I'm going to ask you something slightly different right. in a second too. One of the periods which I always seem might be interesting, but I wonder whether um, it's a it's a raw subject is Vietnam. I wonder whether people uh, look to play that, or whether it's too difficult to play, or it's actually just a bit sort of a bit raw. So uh, I wonder what your thoughts there. Yeah, um, well, we, my country was involved in the Vietnam conflict, uh -huh. um, and the, at the end of the day, the the, the Politic, the politics and all that kind of that, that all that kind of stuff, the, the the geopolitical kind of crap that goes with every kind of war, I tend to just push that to one side because I'm interested in the conflict, in the actual fighting and the, and the battle. Now the thing is, a lot of people look at certain conflicts and they go, "Oh, I can't play that." Or, for example, if someone's building up a, a German force for World War Two, they go, "Oh, I, I would never run SS." And my attitude is, why not? Why, why not run, run, run the SS? Um, it's not like, you know, I wouldn't play a game where you have a concentration, like a, like I'm going to have a model Dachau, uh -huh. and, and then the train pulls up and people get off the train and then we take them down to the gas station. Like, no, that, that's, that's, that's history and that belongs in books and that's, that's all great, but it's not on, you don't put that on a war game table. But... I have no issue with playing any period of warfare. I mean, I even play, I've played games from uh, covering uh, the Afghanistan conflict. Right. And I'm, I'm an Afghanistan veteran. I mean, Brigadier, Brigadier Young, uh, one, you know, a great, a great name in the war gaming fraternity, he was a World War II veteran and he played lots of World War II games. Uh -huh. um, and I was diagnosed with PTSD after 33 years in the army. So, but but the thing is, but make no mistake, they're, they're little toy soldiers on a table. It's not the real thing. It's not even close, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not even close. It's it's a it's a game, and it, you can, in some would say, it's a simulation. Yep, I'm all down. I'm down with that. But here's the thing, like I said, I was diagnosed with PTSD and and I spent eight weeks in a psych ward and all this kind of stuff. And I went through all that, that, that stuff and I came out and the first thing I wanted to do when I was in the psych ward, I was painting miniatures. <laughs> that, was that, my, that was my mindfulness stuff. I was like, what are you, you going to do today, Scott? I'm going to paint some miniatures. All right, yeah, well, whatever floats your boat, man. And so... Um, I was, I was actually even painting Taliban fighters when I was in the was it, in the, in the cycle. <laughs> and nobody gave her, nobody cared. No one was going, oh, I'm, Scott's got little mini Taliban in the ward. I'm, I'm, I'm triggered, man. It's like, no. <laughs> what, what, what triggers me are certain smells. You know, there's certain smells and certain sounds, like um, screaming children. Can't bear to be around screaming children. Now there are reasons for that. I'm not going to bore you with them, but, but there's but like the, the 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 sound of a child screaming. That's like, oh, I'm I'm about to go up the wall, man. I've got to get away. Um, but a war game table with little little miniatures and stuff. Yeah, nah, that that's that's my bread and butter, man. I love that stuff. Right. And, right. And it's also it's not. Um, yeah, and I and I've got lots of veteran mates, and none of them have any issues gaming any conflict. Uh, I think it's a lot of people feeling uncomfortable on behalf of other people sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, I think a lot of people go, "Oh, we really shouldn't game that because it's it's too close to the it's too contemporary." 
it's like okay so the kids can't play cops and robbers anymore and and you know so yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, I don't have i don't have any problems with it because it's not it's it's just a it's a to me it's just a hobby it's just i'm moving some little models around on the table and i'm rolling some dice and i'm and i'm socializing with people and i'm sharing a passion or an interest that they share and really i mean a 28 millimeter taliban fighter or a 28 millimeter hoplite greek or a 28 millimeter confederate or a 28 millimeter british para from world war ii it's it's, it's still just little lumps of either plastic or metal on a table Yeah. When, when you're talking about yeah. Australia, it's just specifically to Australia and, uh, you know, yeah. how you play there. You also, you mentioned about uh, the Blutcher campaign, etc. Obviously, we're in this really unusual circumstance, but actually living in Australia is an enormous place. So therefore, you know, there might be similarities in terms of the logistics about how you play. What is it, what's it like playing in Australia or how different is that to now? What What's that like? Well, I mean, the, the, the first challenge for, for, for most of us is, I think, gaming is actually finding people to game with. Right. Because the reality is we're a, we're a pretty small niche kind of community of people, and I suspect the vast majority of, of society looks at us and go, they're odd. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, it's the first challenge is to find... So Australians are very good at networking, uh-huh. Like because you now, like I've got to find someone who shares this interest. But um, I live, like for example, where I live, I live in a place called Strathfield, say, which is uh, outside of a, uh, an inland city called Bendigo, which is two hours from Melbourne. Right. And so, and most Australians live in the big cities. And so, if you're in some, if you live in Melbourne, not a problem. It's no different from living in, well. You know any major city, I guess, like Birmingham or um, mm-hmm. Coventry or something like that. I don't know. Um, so you, you'll find people in clubs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're in a, a remote lo- lo- uh, location, it's, I mean, I, I, there are guys that I game with that live, you know, about an hour from here. Uh-huh. So if we want to get together for a game, they have, they I either have to drive an hour to them or they have to drive an hour to me. Um, but so there's a lot of, I think I suspect there's a lot more solo gaming going on in this country than probably the United States or the UK because of the people being um, remote to one another and so when this this virus thing happened this current unpleasantness um, adapting to solo playing games um, remotely it's like oh I've done this before yeah, yeah. you know um, and with the, especially with the advent of the internet and, and things like Messenger and FaceTime and Skype and all these other things, you know. Um, like I, I think there was in, in one game I was playing with Rowan and I, a mate of mine, who, he's a, uh, lives here in Bendigo. Um, when the lockdown came in, we were basically halfway through a game of Cat for Bra. Right. So we continued it with me basically using an iPad with a camera and then I say, well, mate, I'm just going to do a fly around of the battlefield and I pan over to his guys and go, like, what do you want me to do with these guys? And, it, the, and the funny thing is it's a little bit more realistic because a, a divisional commander go, can't say, listen, you need, to move, you need to move your brigade 20 metres to the right. They have to give just rather general orders. So, right. like, move your brigade to cover the flank of the centre brigade, which is going to attempt to capture that... Hamlet. Yeah, yeah. And so that's the kind of so Rowan to go. Yeah, move those guys. I want them to cover the flank of this brigade. Okay, we'll do. And so that's all I would do. And I would go. Well, how would I best? Do it? And then I, I'd say oh, that's what I've done with them. And it was a you know I'd show him on the camera, and he'd go, yeah, yeah, that looks fine. Right. And I mean, I, I mean, any game that requires you know pontificating over the millimeters. I, I don't play that anyway. Yes, yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. So.
questions I really want to ask is very much about uh, you know about your channel so uh, you know check your leader TV really good really enjoy it there's loads of stuff there how you know what prompted you to do that how uh, you know how do you find it do you prefer doing it off the the YouTube channel or the blog that you've got you know all, all that stuff with regards to you know you getting out there to other players yeah I, I think now I'm pretty sure you, know, you can correct me if you're if I'm wrong I suspect that one of the, the reasons people play war games is for the social aspect of it. Uh-huh. I mean, because otherwise we just play computer games. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we just play against an eye, you know. And so, and I think we like to share our passion. So it was a, it was for me, it was a case of, well, you know, I, I'm playing these games and we're, we're having a bit of fun, you know, Rowan and I or, or whoever else, you know, Arno and I, we're, we're playing these games, we're having a bit of fun. You know, it's it's not that much. It's not that much. I didn't at the time. I thought it's not that going to be. It's not going to be that much more difficult to put this up on a YouTube channel. <laughs> what an idiot I was. <laughs> um, yeah, as you, I'm sure you, you you know. It's like it's actually a lot of work, man. Uh-huh. You know, to to edit it, and, and especially if you want to do it right. And if you look at my early videos and stuff, it's like. What kind of, what kind of five year? He'll let the five year old have a camera, <laughs> man. Like, what the hell's going on with this? Uh, and not... then, um, but, but, but you get better at it, and then you go, and the, and I'm I'm a, a fairly uh, interested in detail kind of guy, and I, that's a carryover from my time in the army. It's like, and if something's not right, it's like oh, I'm gonna have to do that again. And so it was just a matter of. Um, wanting to share the games and put them out there for people to to look at and if they enjoy them that's great and if they think they're naff well okay that's fine as well but I just put them out there and people can either watch them because I, 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 I love watching your games I love watching Travis's games and there's a couple other channels out there that I, I you know I, I, I watch every now and then but predominantly it's your channel and Travis's channel which I think, oh, and uh, the guys that, that, that were beasts of war, I think what really got me interested initially was uh, the, the, the games that were the two fat lardies were doing uh-huh. on um, uh, change from beasts of war to tabletop something. I can't remember now. But, um, yeah, it was just, a, it was just an odd, a, a thing I wanted to do because I thought, well, I'll just throw these things out there. I mean, we... I used to write battle reports and put them on my blog. And so I think it's one of the aspects of most war gamers. They like to record their, the battles. and It's, it's almost like history. You know that's exactly I mean? it. Yeah, it's funny you when you take... Read about, yeah. you, read about, you read about battles in books and you go, oh, man, that, that sounds really interesting and, you know, or whatever. And so it's, a, it's almost like a, a natural extension. It's like, okay, so I fought this battle and this is how it played out. And this is what went wrong, and this is what went right, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it in a battle diary, and I'm gonna put it out there for people to look at. But yeah, now yeah. it's like, well, I can put it on a video. That's a, it, absolutely. I mean, I even did, even when I was in my teens, I used to write down at the end of the games that I played. It's like a historical thing. It really is. I think it's just that that military history thing that you really enjoy. You put that together, and the natural development of that is then putting it onto a video. It's funny when you talk about looking at the first videos that you've done. Things like lighting and the shadows on it and things like that you think oh god that's that's terrible and for ages i couldn't even work out that you can do more than 15 minutes on youtube so i used to put like three videos together before i mean it was simple things to work around and you think oh god why didn't i do that before but it's just that learning you know and you enjoy that process with the uh, you know with you know, with other yeah. people. Look, I'm really conscious that I'm thinking that we're getting to a point where we'll get to 40 minutes and I don't want to just get cut off without saying thanks very much for, you know, for doing the video. This has been really enjoyable. I've really enjoyed the chat and it's really, really good. So, so thanks, Scott. Thanks for, for, you know, having a conversation. Yeah, no worries, mate. Any time. It's been good. Good. Good stuff. Well, look. Is that social aspect of the game I was talking about? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Look, I'll put together all this into a a video itself like I've released before. I'll send this out there and uh, I'll put a trailer with it as well and I'll put that together and I'll try and use as many of your photographs as possible. So I'll go through information. If there's anything that I need, I'll drop you a line uh, if you can send a a snap or two 
and that's it and we'll work from there no worries mate you Great. take care of yourself and you and you thanks very much for your time and uh, have a good evening give 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 my regards to the motherland I will do <laughs> all right Good see night. you Ta -da. Bye. see you mate bye and there we go, that was a really great conversation with Scott. I hope uh, you enjoyed it. If you've got any thoughts, then uh, please put a comment on the YouTube channel or uh, if you want to join and uh, continue conversation, then uh, please do so coming into the Facebook group, which is the Wargaming World Facebook group. And uh, if you have any thoughts yourself, if you want to get involved with these interviews, if you want to have a, a conversation and uh, share your thoughts, then drop me a line and let me know. So, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for watching, stay safe and uh, enjoy your wargaming.